to introduce uh, today's speaker, Alex Yu, who's here on sabbatical uh, until mid-February, I, I believe. And I think Eileen introduced uh, Alex uh, to everyone at MVZ Lunch a few weeks ago when he first arrived. I think I was out of town on, on that uh, particular date. And I understand she pulled his uh, PhD thesis <laughs> off the shelf here. Uh, so he got his PhD here with Jim Patton in 1992. Uh, before that, he did his undergraduate and master's degrees at, at, uh, Nas at Taiwan National University. Uh, and then after he left here, uh, he did a one-year postdoc with Chuck Langley uh, at a time when Alan Orr was in the group, uh, and they worked uh, together. And then he did another one-year postdoc with uh, uh, Becky Khan at the University of Hawaii. Uh, and then he, he went back to Taiwan, where he's been a, a professor since uh, 1994 at, at uh, um, National Taiwan University. Now, it's hard when introducing Alex to know what to talk about, because he's one of these people with such diverse interests, it's really remarkable. So he, uh, I think of him as a mouse evolutionary geneticist, but that's my own myopic worldview. Uh, over the years, he and I have published a couple of papers together on mouse evolutionary genetics. But if you look at his CV, that's a small part of what he's done. Uh, he's, he's done a lot of work on shrimp. He's done a lot of work on birds. He's done elevational transects uh, in Taiwan. He's worked on the gut microbiomes of mammals. He's worked on flying squirrels. Uh, and I'm sure I don't know the half of it. Uh, and so you might think, given all that, well, he must be here to work on something with vertebrate biology. After all, he's uh, on sabbatical in the MBZ. Well, no, he's come back and he's now working on a book on the history of science uh, in Taiwan. Uh, and uh, so, and he's apparently taking a history class here on campus, uh, which meets Wednesdays at noon. But he assured me that he would skip class today to come to, <laughs> to, to give his talk. Uh, Alex has also uh, graciously agreed to give a second MVZ seminar on a different topic uh, later in the year, I think in, in January. Uh, so Alex, I am so delighted to have you here for these months. Uh, and uh, I look forward to continued interactions. and. Uh, um, welcome back to the MVZ. Thank you, Michael. It's very uh, kind uh, for you, for Michael, to introduce me. Also very kind of him to uh, to let me come here and helping me getting the visa, you know, etc., and setting up a uh, base here. And most importantly, that he is so open-minded to have me saying I'm not going to do things in MBZ, and instead I will go out to other departments, and, uh, and so that is very kind, and I appreciate him for that uh, tremendously. Okay. So being an MBZ old timer is, is have some advantages, except that you know you're you're old, and that is but <laughs> <laughs> so being old does have some um, good thing because being old. I can tell you stories. So the story I'm going to tell you about is about a flying squirrel, and it all started with my major professor, Jim Patton, who is not here today. Uh, however, uh, over the years, I have learned that uh, this is a very uh, popular cartoon uh, in, uh, in American uh, culture. And there's a flying squirrel named it's Rocky, and his uh, not so intelligent friend, uh, Will uh, Bullwinkles, and just look at them. You know, they have some similarity, and also they have differences. Uh, so they differ because one is the uh, uh, fall gut fermenter, and the other is the ice fermenter, right? And also that one is big, and one is tiny. Okay, and so they have distinct, different uh, ecology. And then if you look at this cartoon and say uh, uh, this rocky is flying down, and I hope that somebody in the science circle would have put some more effort to tell the cartoonist they did it wrong, because <laughs> this one does not show any of the flying uh, uh, membrane or the wing, so to speak. Okay? But nonetheless, we know that uh, they live on top of the trees, which is uh, a very tough Habitat uh, to speak, you know, to start with. Be, although it has some, it does have some advantages. One is it the less competition, and not to um, to be bullied by the bull guy, uh, the big guy like bullwingo, 
But on, on the other hand, you know, you're living on top of a tree, and you don't you don't have too much to eat. Okay, the only leaves that you can eat, and the leaves are terrible because they are they, they contain lots of fibers, and they also have a lot of plant defense mechanism. You know, they have a lot of phytochemical which are toxin, a toxin to the to rocky. Well, Rocky does not have the, the wing flag, but you can look at this. Southeast, uh, this is fly squirrel in the Southeast Asia. And you can see that in, in the forest. You know, somebody described to me what really is the fly squirrel in the forest. That's the, a piece of rag. A flying rag <laughs> is falling down <laughs> on a treetop, okay? And this photo shows exactly that. And then I have to relay this to my major professor, uh, and also back to uh, the time I was doing my PhD, uh, I wanted to go back to Taiwan to do an elevation of gradient study. And uh, he granted me the permission and he also came along with me. So in 1989, uh, actually it's, uh, I believe it's November, okay? And then he came to Taiwan with me and we hiked up to this mountain area. And that is the highest peak of Taiwan. Okay, let me tell you, this is about 80 kilometers, okay? So this may be uh, 30 kilometers, and this from the sea level go all the way up to 4,000 meters. Okay, so this is very, very steep terrain. And that is it's like, even, even though this is in the tropical area in winter, you get this, get snow. And this is, this is the highest peak I told you about, and this is, look at here, you got a, a, a stretch of forest, and, and um, that is one place that we uh, went to. Okay, and the other place that looks like this is covered by a very good uh, virgin forest. And to some places that we have to cross the trail like this, and sure enough, you can see this guy, uh, this is Jim Patton. Okay, <laughs> and that is me. Okay, so this is the place that we have gone to. And also, um, I already. Uh, Spent two two years uh, in Berkeley, and I passed my oral, take a lot of a bunch of classes, so I'm educated you know, by Berkeley people. So here, you know, uh, doing in the field work, and Jim, doing uh, as you know him, he was so quick, you know, skinning and stuffing, you know, and and I did the same thing too. He kept he kept coming to me and say, Alex, are you done yet? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and after three times, you know, because I already been educated in, in Berkeley and uh, going everything against my docile nature, I said, Jim, shut up, get back to work. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there he is, and you know, stuffing, and you can see the specimen here, and you can also see a, a liquid nitrogen here. And, and this is a, 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 a jar, we keep the formalin and we preserve a lot of uh, the specimen. But the highlight is this. We hired some Aborigine people to come up with me to carry stuff. And so they were so excited because this is an opportunity for them to go up and to hunt. And so with a, a, a homemade gun, you know, shotgun. And this, you can see Jim is very excited about this. And the next day, this is what we got, you know, and the, the Aborigine that they got three flying squirrels and with three shots. Okay, I have to tell you how, what the, the gun they had. Uh, sorry, uh, the gun. With, uh, the, you know, the gun was like a muzzle loader. You know, very <laughs> primitive. But I, so three shots, three flying squirrels, <coughs> and one of them are here. <laughs> so I was able to pull out uh, from the from the collection, and you are welcome to see. And you see the tip. So this is an unusual one, so I got a tip, white tip, okay? So that is, that is my, um, one of my few connections with the flying squirrel. But that is start everything, uh, the, the story I uh, unfold, okay? And so after a few drinks, we had a good time with that. Um, uh, we came down from mountain, we go to a hot spring, take a bath. And then we were invited by the Aborigines to have a few drinks. And there is Jim Allen, you know, and he looked the same. And, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I wanted to work on the flying squirrel, but this is some time after I got back and I lost contact with the Aborigines. I really need their help to collect the samples. So I asked one of my friends, you know, see if you can help me. Uh, was, was, was getting in touch with the Aborigine again. 
And he told me, so what are you going to work on? I said, well, when I screw, uh, got micro, but literally it just means that I fly and screw feces, you know, shit, in other words. <laughs> and then he told me that, well, look, Flying squirrel actually is a, is a prescription in, in ancient Chinese uh, medicine book. Okay, so this is the name, and this is you know this is the, this is the effect. Basically, it's an anti-inflammatory drug. Okay, so I, I'll, you know I don't know this. I, I go into the literature and look at this. This is a medicine book, and this is this is a comment of a British historian saying that <coughs> this is the book, and it. it uh, it's saying the author is a Chinese naturalist, just like we all do, okay? And then he said, this is a very, very high scientific achievement. So what I'm going to do in the, in the following is to, uh, science, is, to, uh, is to continue my scientific uh, endeavor. And so, so fair enough, so I decided that I must go and see this uh, practice of using the flying squirrel of feces uh, <laughs> as medicine. So I look it up and I find out there's a, there are some farms in, in China. So I, I try my very best to get contact, eventually get there. And this is what it was, it was like. You know, this is a second species of flying squirrel, which is uh, it's a, a Trogopterus, okay? And then this farmer, they, they, have a, they have a bunch of them, and they do farm them, and they breed them, and then they try best to get their uh, natural uh, food to feed them instead of uh, using the artificial or, or food. And then they collect it, and you can see this. And they do do this, okay? And then this is what it's like. I hope that I don't ruin your lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and then nowadays, you go on the web. You know, this thing is real. I'm telling you, this is science, okay? <laughs> okay, then, uh, come to a point, I decided that this is two species, not enough. I want a third species. So I talked to a, 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 a Japanese colleague who is a professor in Hokkaido. I said that, well, you know, do you work on that? She said, yes, we do uh, capture recapture work. Wow, wonderful, because then we can get a lot of data, right? So I said, well, maybe we can do a time series analysis of the fine squirrel uh, uh, microbiota in the feces, you know. So he said, yes, we can try that. But, you know, after contact several times and there's no response, and eventually I decided to go <coughs> on and to, the, to Hokkaido and to see what's going on. And so I went there, and this is the <coughs> Japanese professor, this is my student, and um, this is the part that they, he brought us to, and look at this, you understand what's that, right? That's the, in the winter time, that's the, that's the marker, you know the snow is going to that deep, okay? And so I understand that this is not the, why it takes so much time, so long for him to collect these samples, and look at this. They cannot trap the flying squirrel because they are commissioned to do to monitor the uh, weather, the climate change in Hokkaido. So they're using this, studying this flying squirrel to see the response of the flying squirrel. So they, they build this nest box and they just wait and they go into there and they grab them and they measure everything, you know, mark them and release them. And at the same time, I told them, you've got to get a poop first for me, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so he, he uh, gave him the iron later, you know, I did, I did everything, mark, and, and he. He followed, and eventually, I mean, in, in, in that forest, sometimes you will see sign like this, okay? And that's real, that's real in Hokkaido. You have to be very care careful, and sure enough, that's what we saw. And then he treated me well, and uh, we went to a good Japanese restaurant. <laughs> at the time, you know? And so this is Professor uh, Oshida, which I have uh, high appreciation. So, there are three species. One is Katarista from Taiwan, and this is now the you know, Aborigine like them. They actually eat their gut content. Okay, they do that, okay. And then this is Xi'an. Uh, we collect that place in, in China. It's near Xi'an, and this is a species connected to ancient massive book. And then this is the, is the Hokkaido species is connected to a climate change. Okay, so what, the, what do they... Uh, have in common. Of course, a lot. <laughs> See, you know, we're, we're, I know I'm, I'm being a videotape, so I'm not <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and so this is, this is how I think of them. You know, they are 
they're on a very bad diet, they eat leaf, and they have to count on the, the, the uh, microbiota to help them to digest, but they differ in body sizes, okay? The Petarista is the big one, uh, there are two species, uh, and then the, the medium one is the Chinese one, and this is the uh, Hokkaido one. And if you look at that, and this is, you know, this one actually has a, a mass-specific metabolic twice of the big one. So that is the difference of them. But they are all French girls, they're eating the same thing, you know, similar, similar uh, habitat, similar ecology. And then we collected the, the, the dropping and we do the uh, extraction of skin to 16 eggs and we do all the stuff. And you can look at this, this is the 19 flying squirrel because they're just doing capture recapture. We, get, we were able to get a lot, uh, quite a few samples. But for this, Brashia got four and then we got two species from Taiwan and this one, their, uh, the, the, their micro biota in the fecal, in the feces, okay? And basically, this is a lot of uh, Hermacutus. I think most of you know about this. And then um, for the, the, the giant French girl, they don't have bacteroidetus. This is kind of unusual. And then we look at this, alpha diversity. Well, the, the four species are pretty much the same. You know, this is, this is the, um, the number of the species. They're, they're all approximately about 100 or, you know, slightly below 100. But look at the other, they have the same um, similar uh, ecological factors. And then, if we look at this, the two most important uh, phyla of the bacteria, and you get this is a little guy and the medium guy, big guy, and you see that they are very different. But basically, they have very few, uh, for the big guy, they don't have any bacteroid, uh, bacteroidetus, and then the small guy have, have a lot. And more, okay. And then this is the this is the ratio that people uh, study human uh, microbiota uh, and also the uh, the body mass, um, the BMI, and they came came up with the idea that if your 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 BMI is larger than thirty, and you should figure like that, and this is so that interpretation of that is when you you have this, and that means that you are better extracting the energy from the from the uh, the, the, the your food. So we are taking this, that like a, uh, the, the big ones, they have a lot of that uh, in order to uh, sus, sus, um, sustain by the leaf, okay? And we look at the beta diversity, uh, the two flying big ones, they have very similar uh, component uh, in their gut micro and they are all separated well uh, by their uh, microbiota. Okay, and so we did a little bit of the more analysis because the, the figure, tell, the, the phyla does not tell you actually too much, okay? And so we do the co-occurrence network analysis. This is, you take a correlation and see how, how these are, are correlated with one another. <laughs> and sure enough, you see this is the, the big one, medium one, and this is the smaller one. Of course, it has more diverse uh, uh, bio, uh, microbiota, the, the, the important one. But I would tell you, I would, it, I would explain to you why the smaller one is, is like this. But basically, you know, we have more samples, right? So we have uh, more variety from. It. But there are other factor I will show you later. Okay. So this analysis gives us more detail, uh, not just knowing their phyla, but we sometimes we can get to their family. Sometimes we get to the genus. We know what they are. If we know the, the characteristic of these bacteria, we know pretty much what they're doing for the, the French girl. Okay, uh, this is just a breakdown of the, the, those, the, the thing. Okay, so what is, next we do is that we try to do this. Um, this is done by this program. There are so many programs nowadays, so we can do the prediction. So we know by the 16S, we know which taxa they have, and then we'll go to the, the database and to pull out the closest um, one that with genome and genome data, and then we based on the genome data, and we can map the gene to the pathway, and we are mostly interested in the metabolic pathway, so we only look at the metabolic pathway, and then we know how many <coughs> genes of, from those are being mapped to the metabolic pathway, and then we know how many genes are there coming from the the, the, the fecal sample, 
and then we do the analysis and uh, divide it, pull out all the genes that are related to that and divide it by their body mass. That's what, what we did for this analysis. It turns out that this is the smallest one, and this is the big, <coughs> big one, and the medium one, and they are certainly responding, as, uh, as we interpreted it, you know, responding to their uh, metabolic constraint because it, it is spe it's a mass-specific um, in terms of the energy demand, uh, also because they are maintaining this body temperature and the loss of the heat from body, and so this the smaller one are uh, having a, a tougher time. So they recruited more of the in turn the body man they recruited more gene in order to help them process the, the energy uh, to to meet the energy demand, and that's what we interpreted the data that uh, and the result. Okay, and then we coming up. Uh, coming back to ask ourselves, okay, look, this is among the three species, right? And then what about um, the individual within one species? And luckily, because we have this Hokkaido uh, species, and this is each one, and they're doing capture recapture. So you got all the data. And so you can see, this is their, um, uh, this is their, actually, this is their body, body mass, okay? And luckily, we have one, it's a juvenile. And you can't do the same calculation, juvenile stand out tremendously. Okay? Although the, the adult one, this is you know going up and this is exactly not even going down. You can't, you know, it's it's just not enough sample size to tell too much. But look, this is very conspicuous difference. So so that boosts up boost up our confidence that what the what uh, what the, the analysis tell us and our interpretation are correct. So this is this is this is what we did with this three uh, flying squirrel. So where the conclusion is that you know they're responding to the energy demand based on the the body mass, body mass, you know, the scaling issue. Okay, but however, that's a, the part. Of, um, however, remember, remember I told you that the smaller guy have the smallest guy have a diverse. You know they have they're very scattered. Uh, because we are getting a sample from different seasons, in different years, you know. And so this is this is this is uh, this is uh, the dark one is 2013, and the the, the empty one is 2014. Okay. And again, this is the uh, composition of their their microbiota. And if you look carefully, there isn't too much difference on the PC1, but there's a wide range <coughs> on PC2. Okay. So Looking at this, this is the month, right? So immediately you will think this is, has something to do with the temperature, right? And sh sure enough, that is what we found out. You know, this is the temperature, and this is PC2, and um, you know, this is the 2013, 2000, and it is a very significant correlation. And this is we do a 2004, 2013, 14 separately, and all show the same trend. They are responding to the temperature, but remember, these are <coughs> these are homeostasis. How come this has anything to do with the ambient temperature? Okay, so I have to give a little bit sidetrack, do a little sidetrack here. So when we went to with two students went to Hokkaido, there are only a, uh, it's a Hokkaido in a smaller town. There, there's the charter plan goes from Taipei to that town, and only once. A month, uh, 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 a week, okay. So I told my student, "You come with me," and then we go there, right? So we we arrive there on, on on Wednesday, so we can only go back the next Wednesday. So what what do we do? We say, "Well, hell, we just go around and look around. We just have a you know, let's have a good time." So we travel. We have rented a car. We went everywhere, I know. And then I told them, "Well, look, we have to." After the prof uh, the Japanese professor introduced to the habitat, and uh, we do a little bit of literature reading, I say, "Well, look, pay attention to the vegetation." We take every picture of the of the of the potential food of the flying squirrel, which is but at the same time we had a good time. You know, one week is too long for us, <laughs> so that was good. And then when we have to interpret this data, and I tell my student, oh, "Look, see what we get." You know, we have look at the, around the forest. And then he said, well, well it's Professor, we got, uh, Jap Japan has uh, vegetation data, uh, so-called big data nowadays, right? So let's go and see. And that's what we did. 
So we pull out the vegetation data. I remember, remember I told you this is, this is uh, 2013 and 2014. Remember 2013, May is lower, <coughs> right? So this is reflection of the, of the uh, vegetation. In 2013, actually I can't remember, I think it's two or three degree lower. And, and then you can see that this is the blow up of here, and you can see this actually, this match to here, okay? So that's one month late, okay? Yeah, there's a change, it, it, it's different. But the flying squirrel is responding not really to the temperature uh, as far as we are trying to explain it responding to the vegetation because they offer different kind of food for them. And so they are responding to this different kind of food, different kind of leaf, and, and so their bacteria, microbiota, also change. And this is the high, and this is low, and you can see that they do have very distinct uh, differences in their uh, microbiota composition, okay? And we, so we believe this is the response that caused by the shift, not the temperature, but the vegetation, and that is their diet, okay? So that's, that's why when we only look at the micro, you know, the little guy, and the, that's why they scatter a lot, because they're responding with more sample. They're res and collecting from different, different months, they're different years, they're responding to that vector. Okay. Okay. Well, I think I can slow down a little bit now. <laughs> okay, so uh, actually we did more work earlier. Uh, we tried to um, look at their uh, metabolomic and metabolite. Remember that they are, they have a lot of, they have a lot of chemical to deal with, right? The plant to toxin. And so we're thinking that this is probably the place when they're doing the fermentation, they also need to solve the problem of, of being tox intoxicated. And so they have to detoxify those samples. So that's, that's what we did. And so we look at the, I mean, this is GC mass that we did. And then uh, we, Try to allocate. Uh, this is a bit difficult because it's just not enough data for these wild animals, and we have to rely on on human database, and we also rely on our uh, very careful uh, calibration of the peak and also the relative abundance in order to do the correction, uh, the, the annotation right. So we turn out we have uh, 600 uh, phytochemicals that we identify, and we are able to use it and. And, and look at their differences. And indeed, this is the high gut and this is the poor gut, and they're very different, okay? And, and among those, a lot of are these chemicals which are part of the or, or metabolite of the, phy, of the uh, phytotoxin. And then we do have, do found less of this in here, and we also found um, less number and also the intensity, the peak of, of the, uh, the, de the intensity also lower in the high gut than full gut. And that's why we interpreted that they are really not only just getting the energy they have to deal with it, and that's how they detoxify in the cecum, okay? And <clears throat> this is just to show you what we, um, part of the, uh, the work, earlier work on the large ones. And uh, we recorded this. Uh, and I also told my students that you have to look at the uh, the micro, you know, because they're so used to use PCR, you know, they're so used to this sequences, and they never actually uh, see the bacteria. So I insist that we have to get some sample and send to people who can do SEM, and this is what we uh, get. You can see that this is the debris. Now you can recognize this is probably the surface of leaf or something, debris, but you can see the bacteria are actually, you know, they're teeming in the tiny hole, tiny, tiny hole in there. So they're real, you know, they're real. They're not just uh, DNA. <laughs> okay. And this is our, you know, only one shot that we actually uh, collected the sample, uh, put them in uh, uh, RNA later uh, at, at, at night. And we also to interested in looking at this. This is the the particle size of digesta and different part of, of the uh, the gut. And what we found out is, look at this. This is this. Um, 
from here to here to here, it makes sense, but it doesn't make sense here, right? Because this is larger than this. So the later on we look at the, the literature, then we realize that someone in the past already knew that, you know, there is a junction sorting. And so the, the animal can decide somehow uh, if this is suitable to go into a cecum, they go into a cecum. If they do not suitable, they go directly into the large intestine, okay? So then here they do all the fermentation to get the, the energy out of, out of this, uh, this uh, diet. And we also, uh, this get a little bit fragmented because it's tough to uh, get everything uh, in order. And so this is the result from the meta-genomic and meta transcriptional analysis. What we found out in the cecum, uh, we got a lot of gene expressed for this, for this, for this, for this. Okay, so our interpretation of this data. Because remember, when I show you the meta metabolite, you know, that differentiate, that's not only is telling that the, the, in the gut they process, process the food uh, in different way, like a, like a, a converting belt, okay? But we have to turn around, think about, think about what does that mean to a microbe? That's the habit of the microbe. It's the chemical <laughs> environment of the microbe. So if you think about what the microbe are responding to that chemical environment. So this is what we try to interpret it there, because these are genes are uh, highly expressed. So we're thinking this, this, this is, you know, in order to, when the, the, the ingestor come into the cecum, this microbe, or they're starving, you know, if, if, when there are no food, but now all of a sudden <coughs> energy coming in, they have to be actively pursuing these, uh, these resources, and that's why they use the, this uh, flagella actively, and they also try to detect where is the best place to go. Remember that a little tiny piece of leaf it actually is a, a lot of nuances uh, of that structure, right? So they will attack those places, and then they will get a super uh, single sugar in, and they do the fermentation and meet their their own need, and they pump this out, and that is the beneficial to the to the host. And then at the same time, they need to get rid of this, and this is the the exporter uh, uh, does for them, and so they also getting a lot of toxin and then put them out uh, to talk to and then so this is this is based on the, the gene expression that we detect by the, the database and trying to to uh, come up with a scheme telling this you know try to figure out what's going on with uh, for this micro in the gut okay and actually early on we didn't go into um, all this analysis, you know, uh, metagenomic and, and, and so on and so forth. We try to use our uh, basic thing that we learned from uh, community ecology. And so look at here, this is the digesta for digesta, and this is mucosa, because we thought in, in the gut you have two suite of bacteria or micro. One is doing the digestion for you, getting the energy, but we also know it's important to pry our immune system, and those guys are not going to live in, the, in your food stuff, and they're most likely to stay in the mucosa. And so we separate those two different locations, and we do, uh, you know, the microbiota analysis. And you, we plot, this is species rank, and there's relative abundance, and this is taking log, and this is this exactly the same data, but without uh, taking log. So you can see that this does not comply to power law and the rest, they comply to power law. But this one have a steeper slope. And by looking at that, we are sure they are distinct communities. Because we know if you have a community structure like this, uh, comply to power law, and, the, uh, and the, uh, these are violate power law, that means that this one is the very dominant. They take up all the, maybe, um, if, if the theory is right, that one take up half of the all resources, and then leaving the rest to share the other half. Okay, and then this one, will, this one, the second one will take half of the half, and so on and so forth. And this, and this, these are all complied to that, but this one does not. Okay. The second thing, if you look at the phyla, you know, here it's red, here it's green, and some, and most of you know, are black, which is vermicutus. And that, 
I think it's because when the, the first step, the resource comes in, it depends on who is there, who can go up immediately and grab the resource. It doesn't, you know, this is a higher level, so it doesn't uh, necessarily, necessarily a particular species, a particular taxon. It's just a chance, okay? And that's what, what I thought uh, in terms of trying to mix in other data. And the other thing I want to say, tell you is that, you know, this is the ingesta, and this is two individuals, but look at this, this is ingesta, and uh, this, is, this is the mucosa, and they only share a quarter of the taxon that they're in. So that means they, they do have a distinction function and different uh, community structure between the two. And finally, we decided that uh, maybe we can do this, do this, so we give a rat and then we shift it to the rabbit feet that to increase the, uh, the level of their fiber in their diet and then we try to isolate uh, from their cecum and see what we can culture and I'm going to be very brief about this and so this is what this is the special alga and uh, plate if you uh, have uh, cellulose and you get you know, all pink if it already been digested and then you get less of that and so it means that the thing we isolate actually are digesting cellulose as we expect it okay and the story gets a little bit more uh, complicated <coughs> later on but we are able to um, to culture that okay and back to the uh, back to the squirrel compared to other guys and this is the uh, this is the um, metagenome and we compare because we are submitting manuscript are being asked by the reviewer. So what about then in terms of the other uh, mammals? So we go back to pull our other people's database and then we do the analysis. And this is cow, okay? And this is a uh, mammal different kind and they are distinct. Oh, of course, this is rumen and this is feces. Uh, this, is, uh, this is cecum and this is a uh, fecal sample. And but however, it shows that at least this and this, even though they are um, fermentation, you know, but they are, they have very different suite of bacteria are working for them. And this is what is interesting to work on the prime squirrel. Okay, well, remember, I told you, we have a dip in the hot spring. So everything Jim did, on that trip, you know, have something happen in, later on. So I, uh, I was invited by uh, my geology, geology uh, colleague, and because I know how to do this uh, managing own stuff, and say, that, well, they say, well, you know, we want to work on the hot spring. Oh, sure, I can do that, you know. So I joined them, and that's what we did. And this is something, you know, I come back after, this is actually exactly, I think it's 30 years. Uh, so. So I will show you what I did. So I have students coming all over to the United States. Um, they did very well, especially uh, Grace Lee, and he's now an uh, assistant professor in UC Irvine. Um, and then the others, the other two. And this is a little bit complicated because he actually, uh, she actually went to Germany for his, her degree, but her advisor was uh, Linda Vigilant. I think if you know her, yeah, you know, she was a member of Ellen Wilson's lab. Okay, and actually, I wrote a letter for my student to go there. I said, I, I don't know. I, I never met Linda, so I wrote to him. You know, I'm Berkeley. I understand you're a member of Ellen Wilson's lab, and uh, I'm a I'm a student of Jim Hatton. And so, would you please take a look of my a student's application? And she did, and she accepted her. So, you know, having a Berkeley degree, it will, <laughs> you go a long way, it works. <laughs> okay, and then others. Uh, these are the people who work with me. And uh, this is now, and this is the latest one, and she did a master with me, and she was just accepted by the University of Florida, a best school, and she's now going to, she just, she just lie me, just like a what's up me, you know. So she told me uh, she's going to work on the whole bunch of uh, deer um, being collected in Florida. They have a problem with uh, too many deers. So she's going to work on that. And she worked with me on the French girl, which is very good. Now she's working on bullwinkle. 
<laughs> okay, so you know, actually, uh, the story does not end there. So I have a lot of people coming. I mean, almost everybody from MDZ. I when they're going to Taiwan, and I always say, "Wow, so and so in, in MDZ told me I should get in touch with you." And so they did. And so you know, Tina Chen came, and she was after a frog and uh, looking at chytrid, and she's now a data scientist in um, for the. Uh, Bad Conservation International, and Sharon Liu, and she came, and she's now a, a vet working in uh, Berkeley. I don't know where. I, I will meet her in in a few weeks, and she will to hear her story. And she's uh, you know, she's working on. She got her vet uh, degree in Cornell, and she's working with exotics. Okay, she told me exotic animal, which is which means it's not dog and cat or something else. You know? <laughs> so that's good. That shows our inference of uh, natural history on them. And this, unfortunately, she went to uh, medical school in uh, East Western. <laughs> Maybe she will work on human microbiota, who knows. <laughs> and then Emily Chen, uh, she became UCS computer science, and she's now um, working on bioinformation at UCSF, almost finished her degree, uh, PhD. And since here Wang is in the audience, yeah. and uh, she came to my lab for summer, and so I took her out and uh, uh, with two other folks. Uh, she to a mountain to look at the, the frogs. I think that imprint her well. So <laughs> she uh, is getting uh, working here. And she also related to me, uh, we share one sixty sixty fourth of genetic components. So, <laughs> <laughs> so in uh, in the uh, in the Western term that should be she should be like a, a third cousin, uh, maybe third uh, how do you say it? Sir, remove? Yeah, yeah, yeah. sir, remove. Okay. But in, in, in our Chinese uh, traditional term, uh, she is my uh, grand niece. So she had to call me grand uncle. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. You know, show uh, the earning the respect I deserve. <laughs> <laughs> and just, uh, Dana Lin, you know, you know, she just left. She's now doing a postdoc in, in, in Duke. And there is uh, Jennifer Lin. I think she's there. Yeah, she's there. Stand up, let people see you. <laughs> <laughs> she is my student from NTU, and she's on exchange to uh, Berkeley campus for a year. So she just arrived. And I told her, you must enroll in MBG lunch. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, the IG was a micro student, and a day was. Uh, uh, when she was a student, and I invited him over to Taiwan and to participate in the symposium, which was very successful. And the people, inter the student, interacted with them. You know, they saw like a, a light bonding. They still interact, you know, communicate with each other, and so that's wonderful. And I'll show you what I did in the past. Uh, in addition to that, I work on frog. A student, uh, actually, not me. You know, my student, they work on fish, freshwater fish. And this is a marine fish. And uh, Chen Ming, he is a physician. He, he has, he's an MD. He came to work with me because he is a, a doctor doing amnios, amniocentesis, okay, chromosome. And so he loved chromosomes. So because my professor was Jim Patton, you know, who started as a chromosome specialist. So, so he came with me. And I was successful to entice him to go into uh, working with pangolin. A mammal, and then this is shrimp. I assume more shrimp. <laughs> and then uh, we did. I did, like Michael said, you know, of the uh, with the uh, wild mice. And then this is probably the last work I did on wild mice because, and and thanks to uh, thanks again thank to Michael because Michael kindly allowed my collaborator from China to stay, I think it's six months, uh, in his lab in Arizona, because I, at the time, I went to China a few times, and I tried to convince him, you know, how to do the collection properly. You cannot just take the tissue and throw out your specimen. <laughs> so I went there to show him how to skin the animal and try to show him how to do this, but it's just not enough. So. Michael took him in and let him just be there and see what people do research, and that has a strong influence on him. And so eventually we were able to publish this uh, in, in, in the molecular ecology. And I 
he collected all that sample. I collected here, of course, and I collected from here. And it turned out this is a very uh, <coughs> precious sample for how we're going to uh, interpret our data. And um, on that trip, in my day, I traveled 5,000 kilometers. <laughs> and a lot of story, of course, uh, but you have to buy me a beer in order to show <laughs> <laughs> you. Okay. And then I tried to uh, establish a local connection. So I, I went to Japan, Kyoto, and uh, UQ. Uh, and we, you know, he, he, he is a very young professor when I started to work with him. And he was a systematist. He worked on the specimen. He's a he worked on he's a small memo systematist. He does not have much experience of doing field work. So at the time in Japan we travel five thousand kilometers. So I show him how to set trap and how to collect and, and, and I think that is a good influence on him. I also give him the book that Jim published on the Amazon uh, memo, tell him that look, this is this is what kind of work you should you should be doing. And it turned out he is now going all over the places and collecting a lot of samples and also train the local scientists. And I also am very happy that I was able, although I'm on a different mission, but I was able to convince the, I actually talked to the president of their university and their dean, you know, we should do this. We should do a, a, a training, just like a OTS here, I, I, I learned. And so that is what we exactly <coughs> did, and now they are still, it is still going on, it's rotating in the four countries, you know. Mm -hmm. And so that is uh, another activity. And then, like, like Michael said, and I got interested in this, and this is the first time ever I have been to a social science conference. Uh, I feel very lonely there. <laughs> but I was able to convince that uh, some of the in the audience that. Um, is a worthwhile uh, pursuit to know what the science is related to social background and social uh, backdrop in order to understand how science should be done. And then finally, I would like to show that uh, Bernie Payton, he was my contemporary in MBD, so he gave up biology, he started doing the, this, this origami art. I think some of you may have met him here, but he was so good. So he came to Taiwan and did six exhibitions in Taiwan. And the last, the biggest one, we, uh, in six months, we attracted uh, this many people come to do this. But during the, you know, the work, you can see he tried to convey science because he fold animal and tell them, you know, what's the ecology of animal. You know, he had a very nice um, polar bear and, you know, on top of the, uh, the icy water in, in the Arctic. And it's very eye-catching and also uh, convey a strong idea about what's going on in today's ecology uh, globally. And you can able to attract these young kids to come, enjoy it, and most <coughs> importantly, ensure, or at least we try, to attract these young people to come to science. We need good science. Uh, and it won't be long, you know, about 10 years, they're, they're about to make a decision. If we imprint them early on, so we get a whole bunch of good scientists. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so that's it. Mm -hmm. Is that we collect the, the, the leaf, we grind it up, and look at the microbiota. Maybe we can see if there are any connection between the food and 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 uh, you know other than vertical transfer. So we showed that the uh, microbiota in, in the squirrels from different uh, years was different. We said that it was the temperature was different, and then that related to that the uh, foliage was different, right? Yeah. And you thought that it was the foliage that was responsible for the difference. But right. uh, did you try to do experiments where you control the everything, including the, the, the food, the diet, and change the temperature? Because the alternative is that there is some kind of a regulatory process to maintain body tem temperature that can affect the microbiota. Yeah. That, um we would very much like to do more experiments, but um, it's, it's hard to do this with the flying squirrel. Or maybe, if, well, I, I take that back. If we really work hard with the uh, Chinese farmer, you know, the 
flying through a farmer, maybe we will be able to use the animal to do some manipulation. Yeah. Maybe you could do that with the rats. Yeah, we can do that with rat, of course. Yeah, <laughs> certainly. Yeah, but less rat will be less exciting. Well. <laughs> <laughs> but again, you know, in nightling to uh, in terms of scientific discovery. I want to be a flying squirrel farmer. I'll just put that. On. <laughs> <laughs> Going back to the, the use, traditional use of the, the squirrel feces in medicine, I don't know enough. I don't know, Michael, if you do, if any of the bacterial taxa that you identified relate to that and are known to have properties that uh, fit with the traditional use. No, we didn't. We didn't really look into that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Although there are actually, when we submit the manuscript, we're having some problem with the reviewer editors, you know, they are, they are before they send out for review, they're asking me, so do you have a permit, you know, I'm, my guy, you know, I mean, look, I, I have to write in, in the supplementary and writing a letter to explain to what's going on, I tell them, you know, I go to this farm, and this is not well known in the Western world, and, you know, it's very hard for you to believe that they are using this as medicine, you know, they're trying to grow shit with medicine. <laughs> But I told them, you know, look, I, got, I have to do this again. You know, it's very useful. I told them I got a degree from Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> so I know the West and the East. I'm trying to bridge the gap. So I tell them this is true. Then they will send out for review. Okay. So, so, you know, and I do get the, uh, I just search the literature. Chinese uh, scholar, they, they do a lot of um, analysis, but they're all probably in, in Chinese. Okay. I did find Korean scientists work on this and probably in, in English, and they do have, find some uh, chemicals that they think it has some medical effect. But again, it needs some work to link that to the, the micro. Yeah. Yeah. And they were saying that the farmer telling me they have to feed the flying squirrel with uh, the natural food, you know, the, the uh, What's that called? Chinese uh, apple BT or something? Yeah, it's a it's a it's a cypress, but it has a vertical flat uh, leaf foliage. Yeah. yeah, they said they they must feed them this in order to have better effect. So that must have something to do with the food, and also the 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 techs are working on those in order to you know. So it's a lot of thing to to uh, to dig into. Yeah. What is it prescribed for? Oh, it was, uh, in general, it's anti-inflammatory, yeah. But if you look at the alert, you know, the, the medical book, you're saying, um, it said it tastes taste bitter and sweet. And then it said it's good for anti-inflammatory, and if sometimes, you, some, some, you know, depending on which version you look, sometimes say it's good for diarrhea, uh, sometimes you're bleeding, and uh, it's good for stopping the bleeding, something like that. You know, and it's, but you know, in the early days, the, the word are uh, very vague, you know, very, uh, you know, not very precise. So it need to be uh, look at carefully. But as far as the farmer is concerned, they're, they're, they're earning big money. They're selling that and, you know, to supplement their income. And that's why I show you, you know, the, the ads uh, online, you can see. And also the photo. I actually, uh, that's, that wasn't my photo, that was a photo I searched on the web. There, there's a news report telling people, the farmers that you should try to do this because that will increase your life, livelihood and your income. You know? have a question over so, here. Sort of uh, similar to the question asked over here, um, you know, you mentioned it gets really cold and during winter months mammals often reduce their body temperature. So possibly during the winter uh, with cooler body temperatures, it sort of selects for different microbiomes that perform better at slightly cooler temperatures. So that might be another explanation. You yeah. can just look at growth, um, temperature sensitive growth patterns of these different microbiomes. And yes, that, uh, yeah. But that would be hard. I'm, we, if I can, if I were able to go on, I would definitely pursue that and do a different kind of experiment. But I'm shifting to history, you know. <laughs> 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 yes. Uh, great talk. A lot. Um, I, you mentioned that the for meta analysis of the gut microbiome that the flying squirrels were notably different, but I saw that it was comparing to like car omnivores, carnivores. Mm -hmm. Do you know how they compare to other squirrels? Uh, yes, we do. Um, I think it's late, right? Early. Uh, 
she did the work with um, Jeffrey Gordon, and so they get all, a lot of angle from the zoo that do the uh, fecal analysis. If we, we, we actually have, a, a, in a different paper, we do really plot right. that, with the, and it's very different from squirrel. Yeah. Or maybe, you know, I don't know, maybe the squirrel are there, they're everywhere, they are, they're urbanized. So we don't know, maybe is the squirrel different or, or the, you know, so we just know, we don't know. Yeah. Okay, well, if you have more questions, Alex is sitting in the office next to mine, and he'll be here until uh, February. And uh, with that, let's thank him one more time.